Hello, my name is Lucy. You probably know me by now. I am not real. I'm more like a figment of Daryl's imagination. That's his beautiful wife with him. And I'm not just trying to get points just because Daryl programmed me. I will be your co-host this evening. Tonight we will take a journey into the mind. We will explore morality. We will ask, what is the best explanation of how these things came into existence? So, welcome to the Rational Defense of Faith. Thank you all for coming out. I see already, and I know there's a lot of new people, diverse crowd tonight. I want to thank every one of you guys for being here. As I always say at an RDOF event, the absolute worst thing that can happen here is that you get free pizza and free child care. Can't go wrong with that. So we have an amazing night for you tonight. I'm very excited about this one. No matter what you believe, I know that we could have some diversity in our crowd. You came to the right place. I am glad you're here. We are going to talk about some topics tonight, but I want you to know I am glad you're here and you're in the right place. Morality. So we've done a lot of events, but when I posted on Facebook we were going to do an event on morality, people bristled. Facebook got hot as usual. You know, if you want to find the armpit of Christian culture, um, go to Facebook post. <laughs> we kind of show ourselves. Apparently, uh, we had people saying, do not come to this event, that we are New Agers. Okay, I don't even really know what that is anymore, but let me rest assured, it, we are, this is not a New Age event. So thank you for being here. So as you've, if you've been to an RDUF event before, you know what we do is that we have been narrowing down the attributes for the best explanation for our existence. And we all know, and something I've said before, is that the creation is very telling of the nature of the creator. Would we all agree with that, right? So we know from science and philosophy that the universe began from nothing. So that whatever caused the universe had to be immaterial because it created matter. Also, whatever caused the universe had to be timeless because it created time. It also had to be very powerful because it created a universe from nothing. It had to be supernatural because whatever created us created natural laws. It had to be intelligent with a specific purpose with life in mind, including human life, because of how the laws of the universe are so astronomically fine-tuned for us to live. And this cause of the universe must also be extremely intelligent because it created a code DNA code that is so far advanced that it surpasses the designs of the most brilliant minds of our day. And if you want to see these events, check them out. We've got DVDs here. So tonight, I submit now that this cause is also conscious and morally aware because it created consciousness and it created morality. Now, if you're here tonight and you're a skeptic and you don't agree with what I'm saying, I am not here to prove God. What I am doing here is to yet add another step in a, a cumulative set of steps that start to narrow down to something very specific, and that's what this is tonight. Of all the arguments for the existence of God, tonight is perhaps one of the best. I love it because it, it's a crucible. It draws out inconsistencies of other explanation, and is that, that's why I love it. And what I'm going to show you tonight may be why there has been a resurgence with Christian philosophers in the world today, which is going on right now as we speak. So that's what we're gonna to discuss tonight. What is the best explanation for mind and morality? So, first of all, I wanna talk about the human brain. The human brain is the most complex machine in the universe. Little is still known about the human brain. It is 73% water. A piece of brain tissue the size of a grain of sand contains 100,000 neurons, a million synapses that are all communicating with one another. There are as many neurons in your brain as there are stars in the Milky Way galaxy. 
An article in Discovery Magazine compared trying to decode the human brain like popping a cover off a computer and measuring a few transistors and from that trying to guess the content of a web page. And if we don't know about the human brain, chances are we're never going to find out because we're all getting more stupid. That's right. <laughs> Scientists showed that average IQs have dropped down 1.6 points per decade since the Victorian era for a total of 13 points. Now, some might say that they can see this personified in our presidential candidates. <laughs> but it wasn't me. Parents will be surprised to find out that kids aged 18 to 34 are actually more forgetful than people aged 50 to 65. And surprisingly enough, attention spans are getting shorter. In fact, the average attention span in the year 2000 was 12 seconds. Now it's 8 seconds. Folks, that's shorter than the attention span of a goldfish. <laughs> what are we doing? But don't worry about it. If you believe in God, you may be smarter. Because research has now shown that people who regularly pray or meditate showed improved brain function up to 15%. That's right. That's why I don't want to play chess with Pastor Reggie. So back to the brain. Science shows that the, the memory capacity of the human brain is in the petabyte range. That's like the content of the entire web. Now your brain simultaneously processes an amazing amount of information. In fact, it processes two million bits of information per second. Right now your brain is processing all of the information in this room. It's processing all of the colors in this room, the objects that you see, it's processing the pressure of your feet on the floor. It's processing all of these unique things while simultaneously wondering what kind of pizza you're going to eat. Important stuff. It's processing the sound of my voice and associating it with a memory while all the while wondering, who does he look like? Your brain has the unique ability to weigh the importance of data and filter out the unimportant. And that is just a few seconds of your brain. Check this out. How many of you remember your birthday? Let me just see your hand. What did your brain have to do for you to respond to that question almost instantly? Well, first of all, the sound waves had to leave my lips, travel through the air, enter your external auditory meatus, travel down to the tympanic membrane, set up a vibratory force, which travel across the ossicles of the middle ear to the oval and round window, set up a vibratory force in the end of the lymph, which mechanically distorted the microcilia, converting mechanical energy to electrical energy, which travel across the cochlear nerve to the cochlear nucleus at the pontomedullary junction, from there to the superior olivary nucleus, ascending bilaterally up the brainstem to the lateral meniscus to the inferior colliculus and the mini geniculate nuclei, across the thalamic radiation to the posterior temporal lobes, to begin the auditory processing related to the frontal lobes, coming down the track to Victor Jury, retrieving the memory from the immediate hippocampal structure to the mammary bodies, back to the frontal lobes to start the motor response at the bet cell level, coming down the cortical spinal tract, across the internal capsule into the cerebral b donkle, descending down to the cervical medullary decussation, so you could raise your hand. Now, that... That's a simplified version. Simplified version. Simplified version. Simplified version. The human brain. It may be the most complex map ever created. Good morning. Billions of neurons making trillions of connections. Hey. But there's nothing random about them. All these connections have to happen in a specific pattern. It is designed for a function. Designed for a function. Designed for a function. Designed for a function. There are a hundred billion neurons in the human brain. And each one of these is sending tens or hundreds of electrical pulses to thousands of other neurons every second of your life. Second of your life, second of your life, second of your life, second of your life. Your life, your life. Every cell in its place. Every link between cells carefully organized. Nothing random. random, 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 random. Nothing arbitrary. It's almost overwhelming to think about the whole thing. If you think about how the whole brain and nervous system gets assembled, you know, you just want to throw up your hands and say, it's way too complicated. We're never going to understand, understand, understand. How 
how the brain during development generates millions and millions of neurons, sends them to the right position in the brain, and then somehow instructs each of those individual nerve cells to form very, very specific connections. Connection, 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 connection. Consider the processing power of the human brain. Just 1% of one second's worth of human brain activity is the equivalent to the processing power of a supercomputer with 83,000 processors using one quadrillion bytes of memory. The equivalent of 250,000 standard PCs, the culmination of thousands of brilliant minds over the span of hundreds of years with a cost over $1.25 billion and requiring enough electricity to power 10,000 homes. That's just 1% of one second's worth of human brain activity. Using only 25 watts of electricity, the human brain demonstrates maximum efficiency. Magnificent design. It has the capacity to love behold beauty, to experience joy and happiness, and it has the power to even contemplate its own very existence. And so the question is, what is capable of creating the most complex machine in the universe? Random chance or an intelligent designer? The human brain. Now, without a creator, this amazing machine must have only been created by natural processes through an evolutionary system. So what are the chances of something like the human brain coming about randomly? Well, let me give you some numbers. California Institute of Technology calculated the chance of DNA information randomly coming together to form one single protein. The chance they came up with was one chance in 10 to the 600 power. It took a supercomputer working all day and all night an entire year to simulate the folding of a single protein. Folks, that's like random particles coming together and arranging them themselves into words. But not just any words. How about the entire volume of Wikipedia? That's what a chance like one in 10 to the 600 power is. And that's only a single protein. Now consider that there are 100,000 proteins in the average brain cell. On top of that, you have about 86 billion brain cells, 10,000 different types of brain cells. And yet in all of our technology, through all these years with brilliant minds, we have never even been able to create a single viable cell. And yet you have 86 billion of them in your skull. New studies show that belief in God is hardwired into the human brain. Shaheen Lakum, who has multiple doctorate degrees, says that psychologists and anthropologists have deemed that children left to their own devices would have some conception of the existence of God. What is told to us is that evolution evolved this. What's not explained, and what you would wonder is, of all of the billions of things that could be hardwired into a mind, for evolutionary survival of the fittest. Why a God? This is a question that I've often asked myself. So for this reason, atheists will try to discredit the reliability of the brain into just being a series of random firings and, and a very imperfect process. I remember one time I was talking to an atheist professor when I used to do that kind of thing. And he assumed I was an atheist, go figure, right? And so we're talking, and so he's ranting on and on about the, the delusional minds of these believers, 
And I said, okay, okay, press. So, so what you're saying here is that the beliefs of all these millions of people that they hold, the beliefs that they hold are just random byproducts of an evolutionary process. And he's like, yes, that's what they are. I said, so what these people in their hearts, what they know to be true, what they believe to be true, cannot be trusted. You cannot trust the conclusions of these brains. They cannot be trusted. He's like, yeah. I said, all right, I got it. But I have a question. Does that also apply to the belief of atheism? And I think I may have gotten cussed out, which I have before. And he couldn't blame me because people before me have asked this same question. How about Charles Darwin, who says, but with me, the horror doubt always arises whether the conviction of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. If the brain is just a random series of neuron firings, why trust such a mechanism? I mean, it's like trusting a weather computer for marital advice. It doesn't make a lot of sense. But many brilliant thinkers have asked this same question. C.S. Lewis says, supposing there is no intelligence behind the universe. In that case, nobody designed my brain for the purpose of thinking. It is merely that when the atoms inside my skull happen to arrange themselves in a certain way, this gives me as a byproduct the sensation I call thought. But if so, how can I trust my own thinking to be true? It's like upsetting a milk jug and hoping that the way that it splashes will give you a map of London. And he goes on to say, but if I cannot trust my own thinking, of course I cannot trust the arguments leading to atheism, and therefore I have no reason to be an atheist or anything else. Unless I believe in God, I cannot believe in thought. So I can never use thought to disbelieve in God. The existence of reason itself argues for a transcendent mind. As I went through a period of my life trying to reconcile the existence of a conscious creator, I was suddenly struck with something that changed me profoundly. I realized that I was ignoring an elephant in the room. And that was the fact that I even had the conscious reasoning ability to be asking that question in the first place. This was an epiphany for me as it was for C.S. Lewis. So even if we grant the chances and evolution did evolve the physical brain matter, it means nothing because it is consciousness, folks, that is the ugly skeleton in the closet of evolutionary theory. And though your brain may be compared to a computer because it has similar structures and processing memory, it's far different, folks. And that reason is a conscious mind, and it makes you, you. See, a computer can calculate the flight path of a bird. It can tell you about the anatomy of a bird. But what a computer cannot do is tell you what it feels like to be a bird. A computer can decode the pixels in this image, but only a mind can wonder what Hillary <laughs> was thinking. Computers can do face recognition, but a computer could never get the underlying irony in this picture. Only a conscious mind can do that. Computers can pinpoint the locations of people, but a computer does not fantasize about being them. A mind does that. Computers can store data, but a mind is nostalgic. Computers can read and spell check a Facebook post, but only a mind wonders what she meant by that post. You know what I'm saying? Computers request attention a conscious mind longs for attention. And a computer is a physical thing. And for that matter, if the brain is a physical thing. But consciousness is not. You could take apart a brain piece by piece, and I guarantee you will never find things like love, essence, and meaning. Now, a computer may process in certain ways like a brain, but it does not have a sense of what it's like to be a computer. This is called self-agency. And you can touch neurons, you can touch synapses, but you cannot touch conscious self-agency because consciousness is not physical. It does not dwell in some single pinpointed location that can be measured or tested. You could measure the brainwaves of a conversation between my wife and my son, but you could never touch 
pick up or hold the meaning or essence of that conversation because it is not physical. And this means something very profound, my friends, tonight. It means that the most real and important part of you that is in this building tonight is intangible, immaterial, and non-physical. That is amazing. Because naturalism only works in the physical realm. Naturalism is the belief that only the physical world exists. But there is absolutely no scientific proof that a naturalistic process can take a physical molecule and turn it into a non-physical conscious self. And for this reason, intellectual atheists will say that for that reason, self-agency is an illusion. And this is where naturalistic explanations fail, because they fail to explain the very essence of who you are tonight. As conscious beings, we are about something. This is called intentionality, which is the state of being about or of something. Everyone in here tonight, no matter who you are, is about something. But no object or matter in and of itself is intrinsically about anything. This podium right here is not about anything. Now, I am about something. Some things I'm about annoy people. I am about being a husband and a father. I'm about being here tonight with you. But these molecules in my body are not intrinsically about anything. They are not of anything. Aboutness only comes from a conscious mind. Now, in naturalism, we are just matter. That's all we are. We're just matter. Now, if matter is not intrinsically about anything, where does aboutness come from? And like the podium and like a rock, even the physical glob of tissue I call my brain is not intrinsically about anything. Only states of consciousness are about other things. And though YouTube, atheists, and people like Richard Dawkins gloss over this, this is an actual huge problem for real, highly intellectual philosophers who have been wrestling with this for centuries. Small people like Plato, Descartes, Leibniz, Popper, and Eccles who have been wrestling with this. And what this has caused, it has caused atheist intellectual philosophers to have to come to the outlandish conclusion that in atheism, if atheism is true, there can be no intentional states. That we never really think about anything. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty absurd. Why is it absurd? Because that statement is about something. It's about the fact that there are no intentional states. We can't escape it. And this is so powerful because it leads us all, if you use critical thinking, it leads us to the fact that there is more than the material world going on here. And folks, if that is true, that is the end of materialism. That is the end of naturalism. And it points to an external existence outside of nature. Supernatural. Amazing. So the question now is, what are you about? What are you of? We are sentient moral creatures, which brings us to the fun part, morality. Check this out. All right, let's say that there is no God and each man is free to do exactly as he chooses. Well, well, what prevents you from murdering somebody? Well, murder is immoral. Immorality is subjective. Yes, but subjectivity is objective. Not in any rational scheme of perception. Perception is irrational and implies imminence. But judgment of any system or a priori relation of phenomena exists in any rational or metaphysical or at least epistemological contradiction to an abstract and empirical concept such as being or to be or to occur in the thing itself or of the thing itself. Yeah, I've said that many times. Boris, we, we must believe in God. If I could just see a miracle, just just one miracle if, if I could see a burning bush or or the seas pot or or my uncle Sasha pick up a check if you don't believe in God then where's your moral barometer that's just me talking I understand you believe what you want to believe yeah. but if, if you're an atheist you're basing your goodness and morality on what you don't get your moral compass from religion our moral compass in the 21st century is a 21st century moral compass and it's changed, it changes by the century, it changes by the decade. Where does your judgment come? How can you have judgment if you have no faith? And how can I trust you with power if you don't pray? 
considering that uh, atheism cannot possibly have any sense of absolute morality, would it not then be an irrational leap of faith, which atheists themselves so harshly condemn, for an atheist to decide between right and wrong? I'm not a Christian, but I live my life in a good way. And some people say, well, uh, who says what's good is? Well, do you know what? I do. Why is incest wrong? It's, uh, it's not clear to me that it's wrong. If a, a brother and a sister loved each other and used contraception, is, is there something absolutely morally wrong about that? Wow. So before I get into this, no matter what your background is here tonight, and I know we have a diverse crowd, that's what I love about RDOF. I want you to know, whether it's Democrat, Republican, heterosexual, homosexual, you are welcome here. You're welcome in this church. You're welcome here. And I want you to know that, and I want everybody to respect that. For all of us, before we can even discuss morality, we need to decide what is the foundation for our moral values. To understand what we truly believe, we need to play out the implications that logically follow from our belief system. And this is extremely important for all of us when we are considering how we define moral values and duties. The first question I have for you is, is does good and evil actually even exist? Here's Richard Dawkins. Check it out. Atheist Richard Dawkins tells us that in naturalism, there is no good or evil. Here are his very words. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect. If there is a bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. And yet, we hear famous atheists regularly saying that certain things are good and evil. It's either intrinsically good or it isn't. Planet as good as we possibly can. And evil. It is evil. Evil is good. Doesn't make it more good. What it is to be a good person. But remember his quote. No evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. No evil, no good. So, if there is truly no good or evil, why are these atheists constantly speaking about it? The root of all evil. From all this evil. Are capable of good. It's just good because he says it's good. Dr. Evil. Degree of evil. I'm a good person! Saying it's good because it is good, in which case we can just deal with the fact that it is good or evil. And to live a good and decent life. It's not good. But most of the good. It's one of the great evils. Intrinsically evil. Say it's good. 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 Evil. evil. Good. 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 Evil. Good. Evil. Goodness. Maybe it's because the notion of good and evil are so inherent in all of us that we can't possibly conceive of the world without them. Without them. So clearly, though we may say they don't exist if you're Richard Dawkins, clearly the notion of good and evil and right and wrong is innate in all of us. The question is, is did we create them, these moral values, or did we discover them? If we created them, then moral values were created by humans and therefore subject to the opinions of humans. Therefore, they are subjective. If we discovered them, then that means that moral values exist independently above human opinion, that they are true and binding regardless of what any human or anyone believes. That is, they are objective. Now, guys, these are the only two options. Morality is either subjective or objective, and you've heard that. So to properly understand this, let's imagine that Bill Maher and Bill Nye are lost in the forest together. Check it out. Here's the story of two men. This is Bill. This is Bill. They are lost in the forest. Bill says this way is north. Bill disagrees. He says north is this way. How will they ever find true north without a compass? You see, north is not subjective to our opinion. It is objective. 
and if North was subject to opinion, how would we ever know where we were going? We just assume that we do have some internal compass. So let's talk about morality. Where then does humanity find the points of objective reference? Who defines good and evil? In the absence of God, there isn't any reason, any explanation for the existence of objective moral values. Without God, there isn't any absolute standard of right and wrong, and therefore what we call moral values are just the spin-offs of sociobiological evolution. read all the great moral philosophers, including Dr. Seuss. The German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche believed that morality is just a fiction used by the herd of inferior human beings to hold back the few superior men. It's worth noting that he died of syphilis. <laughs> Bill and Bill. <laughs> so in naturalism, morality is just a byproduct of an evolutionary process for survival. And so then is subjective to the survivability of an animal or an organism. But organisms and animals do all kinds of things to survive. What makes any of those actions objectively right or wrong? And so many people will say for that reason that it's just that we decide what's right and wrong. But the question is, which we? Check it out. You're an atheist? I am definitely an atheist. Do you believe in moral absolutes? I, no, I do not. Who makes the rules? We do. Many people say morality is based on what we think. The question is, which we? We, we desperately we so we want we want we we we, we feel what we, what we what we hope to achieve if we if we shouldn't do anything we we, we we all consider ethical behavior we we do have we do have some internal compass if we if we ought to do anything we have we have we have a moral duty but when they refer to we to which we are they referring is it this we or this we what about this we? Or this we? Is it this we? Or this we? To which we are they referring? So obviously, if we say morality is based on what we think, which we? But many people will say that morality is based on happiness. That's the question, is whose happiness are we talking about? Check it out. If morality is based on happiness, then here are some very happy people. Here's happy Kim. Here's a happy murderer. A happy dictator. A happy Islamic extremist. A happy terrorist. Here's a happy Putin. A happy Selma. A happy serial killer. A happy cannibal. A happy child abductor. A happy sex trafficker. A happy slave owner. So, if morality is based 
on happiness, than on whose happiness do we base it? So you're getting the point, right? A little satire here, slight bit. Obviously, if you say that morality is based on happiness, it is clearly subjective to whose happiness you're referring to, right? But people that I talk to will say that some things are just wrong, that it is always wrong to torture an innocent child. It's always wrong to rape a woman. What do you think? I agree, because I believe in objective morality. But let me ask you this. What if a superior alien civilization came to Earth, and they took over Earth, and they believe the right thing to do is to torture children? That's just how aliens raise children. And they come to Earth, and they just start torturing our children. Is it still wrong to torture a child? Still wrong? Okay. Let's bring something a little closer to home. What if Nazi Germany had won World War II? And what if Hitler ruled the world? Hundred years down the line, we have an entire civilization of people who think the Holocaust was right. That's who lives on the Earth from here on out. Was the Holocaust still wrong? If you said yes to that question, then you, my friends, have a moral standard that is above, stands above the opinion of any human, any alien, any dictator. That is objective morality, not subjective. And that is a very important thing about tonight because you have to ask then, where does objective morality come from? Let's hear from a leading atheist intellectual Atheist Lewis Wolpert, who is an emeritus professor at the King's College of London. He's the vice president of the British Humanist Society. He's here talking with Dr. William Lane Craig. Check this out. What I'm arguing is that without God, there is no absolute moral values, no absolute moral duties. We are like advanced primates, uh, and what we call moral values are just these ingrained sociobiological Patterns. Yes, that's exactly what they are. Okay, so, so that is your view. I was, I was not sure of that. Well, then you see, when you make these moral judgments yourself, you're, you're acting inconsistently with your own worldview. When you make moral judgments like wow. everyone has the right to believe whatever he wants so long as it doesn't interfere with others. Where do these, where does this notion of rights suddenly come from? The, the, that's just... History and sociology. Right, just sociologically ingrained yes. behavior. So the... Uh, the pedophile or the rapist or the psychopath or the person who wants to be uh, a, a religiously intolerant persecutor is just acting uh, out of fashion. He's like the person who belches no, not at a meal. No, uh, Hitler wasn't acting out of fashion. He acted in his particular way, which other people objected to. Right, but there wasn't anything morally wrong with what he did, right, on your view? Of course there was. It, well, it was just, uh, it was just contrary to uh, the patterns of sociobiological behavior that have been ingrained into the human species no. not to kill each other off. Why, why was what he did objectively wrong? Because it, made, it killed many people and made people extremely uh -huh. unhappy. All right, but now that goes on all the time in the animal kingdom, right? No. Killing other, other no. animals. No, that does not. Well, when a lion kills a zebra... Oh, when a lion kills a zebra... He kills it to so eat, it? What about when you kill your, 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 your turkey? Be careful yes. with turkeys at the moment. <laughs> yes. Well... Uh, Fine, use, use that example. Uh, on, on atheism, these are all morally neutral acts because there isn't any standard of right and wrong. Sure, there isn't. Okay, so <laughs> then you agree with, with, with... There's an intellectual atheist right there saying that there is no standard for right and wrong based on naturalism. And you heard him suggest if there was a reason, it was based on happiness, but that is clearly subjective. And you know, a lot of times people will talk to me and they'll say that people just have rights. They have a right to be happy, a, a right to live like this. But as Dr. Craig said, on naturalism, where, where do these rights come from? Did they just float out of the air? Where do they come from? Well, people will say that they can see morality because of the evolution of animals, that we can see certain behaviors that animals exhibit. But if you really look at it the right way, there's nothing objectively good about these actions on naturalism. 
Now, we may impose that on them. For instance, when a lion kills a zebra, we do not call it murder. There are no assault charges being filed. When a male shark forcibly mates with a female shark, we do not call it rape. You understand that? And so if we don't have a version of saying that these things are wrong or bad, then how can any act be good? It's just there. It's just there in the animal kingdom. They're just being animals. And it's, in, it's all indifferent in the animal kingdom. As Richard Dawkins says, blind, pettiless indifference. These acts are morally neutral. So it's important to also understand that on naturalism, you and I are just animals. That's all we are is on animals. So what gives a human value over other animals? Where does that come from? Well, atheist intellects see this. Atheist Peter Singer says the life of a newborn is of less value than the life of a pig, a dog, or a chimpanzee. And he goes on to say something that blows my mind. He says that babies need to wait a month after birth to be accepted, quote, as having the same right to live as others. But where do these rights come from? I mean, where does that come from? Him? And even atheists I talk to when I quote that say that that is awful, by the way. But here's what's interesting. At least he was intellectual enough to see the implications of defining moral values in that way on naturalism. As Dawkins puts it, we are just survival machine robot vehicles blindly programmed to preserve our own selfish genes. On naturalism, what makes human genes any more valuable than animal genes? If a plane crashed into the sea, is that a bad thing? Not if you're a hungry shark. <laughs> On naturalism, what gives you more value than a shark? Where does that value come from? If you think you have more value than a shark, then you are guilty of what's called speciesism. That is discrimination in favor of one species, usually the human species. You see, in naturalism, we are just a speck in a vast universe. We're just a blink in a vast period of time, destined for a heat death when thermo equilibrium takes its toll. Depressing, but that's all it is. That's it. That's all we are. And morality is just this silly passing blip on the screen that means one thing now and a different thing later. But see, a lot of the atheists that I talk to, they do not accept this. They say that we just know moral values by what feels right. Check this out. To get an idea of subjective morality, let's look at a quote from a famous actor. In an interview, actor Brad Pitt said, quote, I have a hard time with morals. All I know is what feels right. Many people believe that morality should be based on what feels right. Really? Well, to put this in perspective, imagine these same words coming from the mouth of certain other people. People like this. I have a hard time with morals. All I know is what feels right. I have a hard time with morals. All I know is what feels right. I have a hard time with morals. All I know is what feels right. I have a hard time with morals. All I know is what feels right. All I know is what feels right. What feels right? What feels right? Feels right. All I know is what feels right. What feels right? Right. What feels 
Morality is based on what feels right. Then, whose version of right do we go with? The moral argument is one of the, the most fascinating arguments and, and, and for me, um, I think it's the most uh, compelling because we exist in a universe that has do's and don'ts. It has rules of behavior. There are things we are supposed to do and things that we are not supposed to do. Every human being has this sense that we are truly and really, in reality, obligated to avoid evil and to do good. Everybody has that sense of conscience. There's this real sense within every human being that there is an ought, there is a moral imperative that comes from somewhere. Um, and it is universal, and so if it's universal, it's not just culturally shaped, even though some morality, certainly we would acknowledge, has some cultural factors in it. But this universal ought, this universal imperative, has to point to something bigger than humanity. It really does cry out, in my view, for a moral lawgiver, if we do have moral duties. I can go back to my days before I was a Christian and I lived a fairly wild life. Now, the idea that I didn't want God to exist was a very key issue in my life because I didn't want something to impose upon me. But there was a sense at one level that laws as such were just the imposition of society. They were the imposition of parents or schools or authorities or the police. And only suckers believed that. And yet, when someone did something wrong to me, I was betrayed in a relationship very badly. And I was deeply angry. In fact, I wanted to go and beat the, the people up that were involved in this because I wanted justice for the wrong that was done to me. So even in my non-believing state, that there was no God, there was no, no morality, there was a moral conscience badly orientated that I was following in some sense. Another society may disagree with those very laws. What we say goes for our society might not go for other societies, and a much more recent contemporary example is, of course, what we saw in the Holocaust. We saw the most educated nation at its time come to a point where it was systematically exterminating those who they thought were weak. Now, why? We have to ask the question why. If we jump straight to the idea that they were depraved monsters, we're missing out on key information here. The conclusion here was that if we are just meant to survive, if that's our whole purpose, then we ought to make ourselves as strong as a society as possible. So we're going to weed out the weak. It's our moral imperative to weed out the weak. There is no way we can conclude the Holocaust was wrong if we are cultural relativists, if we believe moral comes, morals come from our own culture or society. But we know as we showed in the Nuremberg trials. We know what they did was wrong, and we're willing to say that. So as you can see, naturalism fails to provide a foundation for the objective moral values that are innate in all of us. But how can you deduce objective morality from naturalism? You see, objective morality is outside of nature. And what does that mean? If you're tonight here and you're thinking, what that means is that there must be some original source for this morality, some morality maker. So the very existence of these objective moral values and duties necessitates the need for a moral agent. And this makes total sense if a moral lawgiver exists. But I want you to check this out. Do 
Imagine taking a time portal millions of years into the past. You travel all the way through time until you arrive in the prehistoric era. How do our current notions of right and wrong apply here? If we believe that some things are objectively wrong, then they are always wrong, regardless of time or place. If something is objectively evil, then it is, and always has been, evil. And even in this primitive prehistoric era, was it still wrong to kill innocent babies? Was it wrong to torture children? And was it wrong to demoralize women? What if we traveled much farther back in time? Back before planet Earth even existed? Would it still have been wrong to torture children? Do good and evil still exist, independent of life or consciousness? Are certain behaviors intrinsically evil throughout the entire universe? Meaning, are they objective? If so, where did this notion come from? Was it merely the laws of physics causing random molecules to come together and become morality? Or did it come from a moral creator? Now let's say we take a time portal into the future. Imagine a very different world. A world where ISIS has gained world domination. Imagine that they have exterminated most of the world's population until what is left is a society who believes that the right thing to do is to kill Christian children. That it is good to rape and torture women. The right thing to do is to sell people into slavery. Would raping women still be wrong, even if everyone in the world believed it was right? Is torturing children still evil, even if everyone in the world believes that it is good? If Nazi Germany had won World War II and succeeded in populating the entire world with people who believed the Holocaust was good, would the Holocaust still be evil? If you believe these things are truly evil, even if everyone in the world believes they are good, then you believe they are objectively evil. They are objectively true, despite the beliefs of anyone in the past, present, or future. They were even objectively true before time began to exist. This is what is meant by objective morality. And if morality is not objective, then it is subjective. But to whom is it subjective? Is it the current culture, the strongest, the most powerful, or the current majority? And which version of morality is the right one? Was it Hitler's version? Or maybe Joseph Stalin's version? What about Kim Jong-un? Or maybe it's the ISIS version? And whom, or what, decides which version is true? It is all relative to each specific individual or culture. It is relative morality. On atheism, there isn't any standard of right and wrong. Sure, there isn't, there isn't, there isn't. I have uh, my own uh, moral and ethical code, 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 code. Whatever scheme you feel is most reasonable usually leads to what we all consider ethical behavior. Whatever scheme you feel is most reasonable, reasonable, reasonable. Who says what's good is? Well, do you know what? I do. I do. There's a steadily shifting standard of what's morally acceptable. Steadily shifting standard, standard, standard. This kind of morality is subject merely to the opinion of each different individual. It will invariably differ from person to person. But if this is true, why does your opinion have any more value than those of someone else? What makes you think 
your version is any more true than theirs. And if this is the way morality is determined, is that the world you want to live in? Is this the foundation of right and wrong that you base your life on? We all intrinsically know that certain things are just universally, unequivocally evil. They were objectively true and binding even before time. Most people live their lives with this understanding that true morality is far beyond the opinions of different individuals, that there is the way things ought to be, that far beyond any human invention, there exists a timeless, universally true, objective morality. So the question is, where did this objective morality come from? It suggests that behind everything, there is a timeless, immaterial, moral, lawgiver, and that ultimate justice does exist. So we all need to understand the implications that follow from how we define moral value. Let me ask you tonight, because I know there's a lot of people in here that believe possibly different things. Do you want to define your morality on, as Dawkins puts it, a shifting scale, a consistently shifting scale? See, most people in the world that believe, believe that some things are just wrong. And that's what we're kind of finding out tonight, is that most people believe that some things are objectively wrong. So as I've said, the important thing for us to understand is where do these objective morals come from? Now, Richard Dawkins himself may say this right here. You don't get your moral compass from religion. But he turns around and says that it's pretty hard to defend absolute morals on anything other than religious grounds. So we start to ask, where do these moral values come from? Let's look at some great thinkers. Jürgen Habernath, who is a, a great German thinker, says, the individual morality of conscience, human rights, democracy, is the direct legacy of the Judaic ethic of justice and the Christian ethic of love. I have always believed, and a lot of people can see this, that the Christian value system is so innate in all of us that we have no idea that we're using it on a daily basis. John Gray, a professor of intellectual history, says that none of the values that atheists promote have any connection with atheism. He goes on to say that the quintessential liberal values all have their origins in monotheism. I love the way, though, that Theodore Roosevelt puts it. Every thinking man, when he thinks, realizes that the teachings of the Bible are so interwoven and entwined with our whole civic and social life that it would be literally impossible for us to figure ourselves what life would be if these standards were removed. We would lose almost all of the standards by which we now judge both public and private morals. It is virtually impossible to live in this world without the influence of Judeo-Christian values. And what I find is most people that judge God are judging him based on Judeo-Christian values. It's called sitting in his lap and slapping him in the face. If you do not believe that moral values came from a moral lawgiver like God, but you believe that they came from evolution, I respect you. But you must understand that logically, your version of morality must be derived purely from a naturalistic point of view, not from theism. Better said, if you do not believe that morality came from God, do not hijack moral values from his teachings. Otherwise, you're kind of like the guy who says that he doesn't believe in football. You know what I mean, this guy? And he shows up at a house one day and he says, hey, it's evolutionary history that just evolved his brain to know that it's just inherently wrong to do a forward lateral. <laughs> <laughs> 
Even though and people like Harris say that they believe in objective moral values and duties, higher thinking atheist philosophers like Nietzsche and Russell see the true results that follow. In the death of God, atheist Nietzsche argues that Christian values have shaped the West. And when they decay, he says, quote, man will truly have to face the prospect of nihilism. Does anybody know what nihilism is? That is belief that moral values and moral principles do not exist and therefore life is meaningless. This is a brilliant thinker. Nietzsche called this the abyss, and he realized the unavoidable results that follow from this. And it led him to say that morality is a hindrance to the development of new and better customs. It makes stupid. Then he goes so far as to say that it is prejudiced, prejudiced for someone to think that morality is more favorable to the development of reason than immorality. Now I'm going to show you, logically, where morality based on naturalism leads. You're going to see here two leading atheists who are telling you, and you're not going to believe your ears, that no one is responsible for any wrong deed and that there is no free will. It's called determinism. Check it out. Determinist. I basically believe that at any one point in time, it's completely the configuration of molecules in the universe, and in particular in your brain, that mandates what you do, and that you could not have done anything other than you did. In other words, you don't have any choices. You don't have any choices. This is determinism, where we are nothing more than robots made out of meat. You don't believe that you're robots made out of meat, which is what I'm going to try to convince you of today. And as you follow the logic of determinism, it leads to the belief that there is no free will. And I'm so glad you're here, and uh, you are a non-believer. Yes. Now, the, the popular conception of free will seems to rest on two assumptions. Okay, the first is that each of us was free to think and act differently than we did in the past. The second assumption is that you are the conscious source of your thoughts and actions. Now, unfortunately, we know that both of these assumptions are false. I hope to convince you that free will is an illusion. And if there is no free will, then this inevitably leads to the cold truth that no one, even murderers, are responsible for their action. Their action, their action. So consider you're a generic murderer. Okay, his, his choice to commit his last murder was preceded by a certain pattern of electrochemical activity in his brain. The moment we catch sight of this stream of causes, the sense of his culpability disappears, that the place where we would place our blame disappears. No criminal has a choice about what they do when they do the crime. It, it is the result of their genes and their environment. No criminal has a choice about what they do. So ask yourself this question, do you really have no free will? Are you just a robot made out of meat? So free will does not exist. You did not choose to come here tonight. I did not choose to just tell you that you did not choose to come here tonight. And so on. They're saying that just as you cannot blame a tidal wave for killing people merely because it's the result of the laws of physics, or you can't blame a meteor because it's just random molecules, 
He's saying that you cannot blame someone like Ted Bundy for being a serial murderer. If this is true, folks, we can get away with anything. But you know what? I have my own Darylism, my own theory here. I think the guy that came up with determinism, I don't think he got it from science or philosophy. Nah. He got it from marriage. You know what I'm talking about. Whoever came up with this had to have been married over seven years. I mean, can you imagine? All right, so they're sitting at the dinner table. He has screwed up. All right, he's messed up big time. And he's sitting there across from her, and he's like working on his papers. I've got it! <laughs> Determinism. It was the molecules in my body that made me do it. I can't be blamed. I am now a determinist. And I'm sorry, but this is me, but I mean, come on, the guys that come up with this stuff. I mean, seriously, do they write Valentine's Day like letters to their wives? I mean, seriously, I mean, you hear this stuff. I mean, do, do they? I mean, it's kind of like, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write something to my wife here. It's Valentine's. I got to say, baby, you're a robot made out of meat. <laughs> and, and I love, I can't say love because I don't believe in conscious states. Um, let's go with the Richard, Daw- Richard Dawkins version. Baby, you're an amazing survival machine robot vehicle blindly programmed to preserve your own selfish molecules. <laughs> Girls love this stuff. Right? I've been missing it the whole time. What if a guy says, though, as many do, that he is predetermined by the molecules in his body to go into a woman's restroom? Some man. Go into a woman's restroom. And I find out that my wife is in that restroom. But I can't blame him because he's been predetermined by his molecules to be in there. So I can't say anything. But what if I suddenly realize that I'm predetermined by the molecules in my body to remove him from the bathroom. (laughs) Quite possibly, deterministically, quite unpleasantly. You can't blame me. It's just the molecules in my body. I might be predetermined to ask Sam Harris and Jerry Coyne, as you saw in that video, why are they, they are so quick not to blame a murderer but yet they make careers out of blaming Christians for what they believe. When according to them, we're all predetermined to believe it in the first place. Sounds like somebody needs a new gig. According to their own philosophy of determinism. Do you see now where naturalistic morality leads? Are you seeing the picture here? This is what I mean by understanding the logical implications of your worldview, especially you young people who are being filled with this stuff. Think it through. God gave you an amazing brain, as you've seen. Critical thinking. I was talking to Pastor Reggie about it today. There's not enough of it going on. Follow the path. Follow the logic. Look where it leads. And if you believe in a naturalistically based morality, but you do not like determinism, as you've seen, then you, my friend, have a lot of thinking to do. If you did not accept this dark determinism, but you believe that some things are just wrong, you, my friend, have a lot of thinking to do. Because objective morality necessitates the need for a moral law giver. Romans 2.14 talks about the fact that the law is written on our hearts and that our consciences also bear witness. And that makes sense of how they got there, these moral values. And I want you to understand something about this verse. It's not just saying believers. Everyone, it's saying, has these written on their heart. And this is something that perturbs me. Because many Christians that I talk to just assume that atheists cannot be good people. That is judgmental and it's flat out wrong. And if you're an atheist in here and you've been told that, shame on the person that told you that. They're an idiot, I'll say it. I don't work at the church. (laughs) Sorry. I got my pastors in my name here. Seriously, I know atheists. And I know them personally. They're good people. They do good things. They have, 
they have morals. But you know what? I know a lot of Christians that are terrible people. This is not about if a Christian or if an atheist can be good. This is about the question of where does the good come from? That's what tonight is about. Check this out. Can you be good without God? Let's find out. Absolutely astounding. There you have it. Undeniable proof that you can be good without believing in God. But wait, the question isn't, can you be good without believing in God? The question is, can you be good without God? See, here's the problem. If there is no God, what basis remains for objective good or bad, right or wrong? If God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. And here's why. Without some objective reference point, we have no way of saying that something is really up or down. God's nature provides an objective reference point for moral values. It's the standard against which all actions and decisions are measured. But if there's no God, there's no objective reference point. All we're left with is one person's viewpoint, which is no more valid than anyone else's viewpoint. This kind of morality is subjective, not objective. It's like a preference for strawberry ice cream. The preference is in the subject, not the object. So it doesn't apply to other people. In the same way, subjective morality applies only to the subject. It's not valid or binding for anyone else. So, in a world without God, there can be no evil and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. God has expressed His moral nature to us as commands. These provide the basis for moral duties. For example, God's essential attribute of love is expressed in His command to love your neighbor as yourself. This command provides a foundation upon which we can affirm the objective goodness of generosity, self-sacrifice, and equality. And we can condemn as objectively evil greed, abuse, and discrimination. But if atheism is true, there is no ultimate standard. So there can be no moral obligations or duties. Who or what lays such duties upon us? No one. Remember, for the atheist, humans are just accidents of nature, highly evolved animals. But animals have no moral obligations to one another. When a cat kills a mouse, it hasn't done anything morally wrong. The cat's just being a cat. If God doesn't exist, we should view human behavior in the same way. No action should be considered morally right or wrong. But the problem is, good and bad, right and wrong, do exist. Just as our sense experience convinces us that the physical world is objectively real, oh. our moral experience convinces us that moral values are objectively real. Every time you say, Hey, that's not fair, that's wrong, that's an injustice, you affirm your belief in the existence of objective morals. We're well aware that child abuse, racial discrimination and terrorism are wrong for everybody, always. Is this just a personal preference or opinion? No. The man who says that it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says 2 plus 2 equals 5. Atheism fails to provide a foundation for the moral reality every one of us experiences every day. In fact, the existence of objective morality points us directly to the existence of God. So the question tonight is, are you living your life based on the idea that morality is subjective or objective? And this is for everyone here, not just Christians and atheists or skeptics. If you're here tonight, like I said, I'm glad you're here. I'm just asking you to think. That's all I ask to do, people to do at the events is to think. Are you living your life based on the idea that morality is subjective 
or objective. You see, this current idea that's going around, especially for young people, of this moral relativism that there is some unwritten social contract that we've all agreed upon that is for the betterment of society. It doesn't exist. You're being told that, but as you've seen tonight, it's impossible because it is all subjective. It's all subjective to the individual. And this is why most, most, almost all atheist intellectuals believe against that in objective moral values, but they have no foundation for it. Consider this tonight, that in naturalism, it took billions of years to create you and your current notion of right and wrong. But you see, this is only a blink, a blip, in a grand scheme of time. And so what we may call tolerance today may be completely different in 100 years or 300 years. Which version is right? Is that how you want, look at me in the eye on this point, if you don't listen to anything else, is that how you want to define moral values? Is that how you want to define it? I hope not. If you say that discrimination against African Americans and homosexuals is wrong, on what basis can you make that statement on naturalism? Because some people say, oh, it's just what we consider wrong. You mean in our current fleeting society that'll be gone tomorrow like a blink? No. Consider that only decades ago, this stuff was considered okay. See, many people that I talk to, and especially the young people, have this idea that the evolution of morals only goes in one direction. But guess what? On naturalism, that's not true. Why? Because evolution changes its mind all the time. According to evolution, it couldn't decide. It puts animals into the water, and then 100 million years takes them back out, and then puts them back in. You can't base morality on that. Who's to say that in 100 years or 300 years, we're not going to evolve a new value system that says, once again, the right thing to do is to discriminate against African Americans and homosexuals? Which version will be right? Is that how you want to define morality? Is it? I hope not. You see, natural selection does not have a worldview. Natural selection is not atheist. Natural selection is not Christian. Natural selection is. It is not sympathetic or tolerant to homosexuality or anything else. Natural selection is a cold, cruel process that seeks one thing, even at the expense of your life. It seeks biological survival, no matter what. And so what are we left with tonight? We have seen that belief in God is hardwired into our brains. And there is no explanation for this on evolution, why evolution would do this, what benefit it would be. However, consider a verse. Romans 119 says, What may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. Now that makes sense. And tonight we have talked about consciousness. I remember when my father was in a coma and I was there in the hospital with my sisters. And I remember the, they had a, a, uh, a scanner for his brain. They were measuring his brain waves. And I remember thinking, and I thought about this a lot, if he had ever had the thought in that coma, how does my son feel looking at me? None of those brain scanners would have ever been able to see that thought because that was his conscious self. And it cannot be held, measured, or tested, but it is the most real and important part of you here tonight. Intangible, immaterial, and non-physical. And this is where we have seen naturalism completely fail because it completely fails to explain the most basic and important part of who you are this evening. And we realize this, we suddenly realize something important, and that is that there is something outside of nature at work in the universe, supernatural. And we talked about aboutness, that no physical thing is in and of itself about anything. Only a conscious mind is about something. So my question to you tonight is, what are you about? Who are you about? Who are you of? 
And with the answer to that question, the need for a conscious creator arises. And like consciousness and aboutness, true objective morality must come from somewhere else outside of nature. And all this tonight points to a moral agent who is outside of time and space, a supernatural moral agent. Now that makes sense. Does this prove God? Not necessarily, but it is another attribute that we do in our events that starts to point somewhere very specific if you think and use critical thinking. And just as the beginning of the universe necessitates a beginner and the fine tuning of the universe necessitates a designer, morality necessitates the need for a moral lawgiver outside of time and matter. Our existence tonight is just as we expect it would be if a moral lawgiver like God exists above all things. And I believe you tonight, we all bear the signature of this creator inside of us by our innate sense of right and wrong. And it tells us much about his nature as being more than just the originator of matter, but as the originator of what matters. Love, compassion, self-sacrifice. A creator who first created these objective standards of right and wrong and justice and then created you with the conscious reasoning ability to understand those standards. And then, and then this is the amazing thing, he himself became flesh became physical and came to earth so that he can endure the ultimate evil in order to accomplish the ultimate good and conquer death forever and give eternal justice. That makes sense. Tonight, I want you to know, no matter who you are, that you can know Jesus. You can know him right where you sit. If you have seen the failure of naturalism, if you know in your heart this doesn't work logically, that there must be some moral agent, I ask you just, just cry out to him. Just give him a chance to reveal himself to you. Because he is more than just a creator. He is your savior. He gave his life for you. And he wants a relationship with you. So tonight, if you want to pray with somebody, we have volunteers, we have people with RDOF shirts, Ken, pastors here, Pastor Reggie, Pastor Dale. If you want to talk with somebody, if you want your life to change tonight, find one of us. I want to leave you with this video right here. You're an atheist? I am definitely an atheist, yes. I'm an atheist. Are you an atheist? Uh, yeah. I am an atheist, yeah. I am, yes. Are you a good person? Are you going to make it to heaven? Um, I would like to think so. Do I think I'm a good person? Yeah. Are you a good person, morally? Yes, I am. Do you think you're a good person? Yes. I, I like to believe so, yeah. Do you believe in moral absolutes? Uh, no, I do not. Is rape wrong? Rape is wrong in our culture, yes. And it is rape always wrong? Uh, it depends on your beginnings. Is rape absolutely wrong? In my opinion, it is. So who makes the rules? We do. So if Hitler made the rules and... He had the majority. If Hitler made the rules, yes, we would be living in a society that uh, Hitler would consider moral. You have a dog? Yes. Love your dog? I do love my dog. Well, your pet dog and your rotten neighbor are drowning. You'd only save one of them. Who would you save? Hmm. That is a tough one. you only save one? Mm-hmm. Why are you hesitating? Oh, I think I would save my dog. I don't, I don't know why I'm really hesitating. Because I don't know, I feel like I feel like people would see me as a bad person if I said the dog. Mm, I'll save my dog. So, is your neighbor not worth saving? Well, he's not worth saving more than my dog is. I'd go with the dog. Yeah. I mean, you you would want to save the animal, so I would want to I would want to save my dog. If well, we're animals. I believe we're all equal. I don't think humans have like a higher like place. So you think uh, dogs are more valuable than human beings? Do you believe in evolution? Yes, I do. I so do. it's just a matter of survival of the fittest. Your neighbor's a, a primate, and you've got a canine, and you like the canine more than you like the primate. Would that be right? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, it's survival of the fittest. I mean, um, survival of the fittest? Yeah, pretty much. You said you believe in evolution. Mm-hmm. So it's just a matter of survival of the fittest. Yeah. If he drowns, he drowns. Big yeah. deal. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that is true. <laughs> Are you an atheist? Uh, yeah. Any fetus is less human than an adult pig. Richard Dawkins. So you don't think God exists? 
Um, more like I know. If there is no God, ultimately we have to find out the answer very quickly for a moral law. Who defines good and evil? No criminal has a choice about what they do when they do a crime. Atheism brings a hatpin to the heart of moral reasoning. All of the atheists have admitted how tough this actually becomes for people who need to define good and need to define evil, define evil, define evil, define evil, define evil, define evil. Define evil, define evil. We have seen how naturalism fails in explaining the vast complexity of the mind and consciousness. In naturalism, there is no objective standard for right and wrong. And if there is no objective moral standard, then right and wrong is merely subjective to each individual organism. In our last events, we have seen that whatever caused the universe had to be powerful, timeless, and transcendent. It had to be unimaginably intelligent because it designed physical laws, DNA code, and life itself. And tonight, we have seen that it also must be conscious and morally aware. We all intrinsically know that design comes from a designer. Mind comes from a mind. Consciousness comes from consciousness and morality comes from a moral lawgiver. So ask yourself, what is the best explanation for this moral lawgiver?